I almost got my first free toy of the day. I don't know if you saw that. It was a, a, a free iPad. Hey, how you guys doing, all right? Nice facility. It's good to see you all here. Uh, I'm Jonathan Aberman. Uh, I'm with Amplifier Ventures and uh, also uh, recently announced an initiative called Tandem uh, Innovation Alliance, what we're involved in now. We've just launched uh, Tandem Product Academy. Maybe some of you know about it already. We're uh, focusing on helping to grow technology product companies. We announced our first 13 companies today. We're going to fill the cohort in the next couple weeks. It's really a great thing. So uh, I've also got a media hat on with what's working in Washington. So that's why they asked me to moderate this great panel. With me is Caitlin McKenna, Senior Director of Customer Experience Innovation at Hilton, and uh, Brenda Sengupta, Deputy Director at Booz Allen Innovation Center. We're going to talk about all things innovation because nothing's more innovative than the three of us. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> we're going to have some fun together. Uh, so we're going to have a conversation with each other. We, we just had a great time in the, in the green room. Uh, hopefully we didn't leave all the good stuff back there. We'll, we'll find out. But uh, we'll also try to leave a bit of time for questions. But the topic that we're going to talk about is innovation, particularly with respect to large organizations change and, and just generally how we're seeing technology really pushing a lot of different organizations to be more creative about how they think about businesses. I think a great place to begin with something like this, since we all sort of come to life with what's happened in, in the past, a lot of the experiences that we carry with us are really useful. Caitlin, if you don't mind, uh, and Brenda, I'll ask you as well, how did you come to uh, end up being a customer experience innovation director at Hilton. It was a linear progression in life, I'm sure. Absolutely non-linear. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for having me, and um, hope your morning is going well so far. Um, to answer that question, I, I, I mean it when I say that it was probably the most non-linear progression I could have possibly taken, um, but I've been grateful for all of my opportunities. Um, started out in investment and real estate consulting, um, primarily in the hospitality space, but um, any sort of real estate in general, and um, found myself over the years becoming a bit of a human calculator, which um, over time, if you can imagine spending year after year in an Excel spreadsheet, um, when you kind of have a right left brain um, need to balance both, uh, one side becomes quite exhausted. So at some stage, I realized I wanted to get into more of a, a brand and product type role and start building the actual products and brands that begin to differentiate. And it's what actually people buy um, from us. And, and, and it's what kind of drives our business in the first place. So I... Um, I also had a love for health and wellness, and there happened to be a job at the time that was um, spa and fitness oriented. So I started to help run our spa and fitness division at Hilton, and um, um, more or less that came out of being a convincing individual, not so that I had the experience. But um, as with many things, you kind of learn as you go. And um, after a few years of that, it, I was um, asked to start our first sort of product innovation um, endeavor at Hilton, and then um, build our innovation gallery. So we um, built the innovation gallery and then opened it last year in October 2017. So we've literally just hit our one year mark. Um, and then from there, um, uh, product innovation sort of morphed into more a customer experience innovation role, which is basically building and defining our brands with the customer in mind. So it's been um, a, a bit of a mixed bag of experience, um, all of which are kind of grounded in my, from my vantage point in the idea of value and how do you drive value and create value for all of your different stakeholders. And in the case of our business, it's really around um, the customer, of course, but our franchisees and our operators and individual hotels. And when you kind of hit all three of those buckets, that's when you build a successful product. So that's the space I live in right now. And um, I will let Brenda go from, from here. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I had a design background. So I was an architect and uh, also had a background in real estate development. And similar to Caitlin, uh, it was kind of similar but opposite, right? Um, I, I spent a lot of my time in, in a professional sense uh, using my right brain, and I wanted to use a little bit more of my left brain and, and uh, do more. Uh, and I didn't want to limit myself to buildings. So joining Booz Allen was a way for me to, to take the way that I think as a designer and apply it to strategy, consulting, and uh, and build out a, a better world, right? So that was, that was really my intention, is to help make that change. Booz Allen's purpose is empowering people to change the world, so uh, I've been very lucky to be in that role. Uh, 
the innovation center we've we've had for about two and a half years is about six years in the, in the making and uh, I started off with helping to build that culture of innovation within Booz Allen and taking that and applying it to a physical space has been really, really great. Uh, we empower people by um, incubating them and engaging them as, as, um, as we grow their skills and help them uh, with their projects. Uh, we, we kind of help to change perceptions uh, with what Booz Allen actually is uh, and, and what it's growing to be uh, by inviting our clients and, and um, partners to come and work there with us and, and also grow out this, this new way of working, this new way of thinking to different parts of the organization as well. One of the things that I find really interesting about, about this whole trend around innovation is that you know, from my perspective, I've been involved in uh, the venture capital industry for, well, I'll admit it now, almost 30 years. I'm 16 years old, just don't look it. But um, <laughs> the fact that that joke gets a laugh is so demoralizing, you have no idea. Anyway, <laughs> see what I mean? Um, see, this is, there's an audience very here. very youthful. I know, it's, it's terrible. <laughs> anyway, um, what I find really fascinating is, is that a lot of people, I would say more than ever, uh, corporations, individuals talk about innovation, it's a word that's on everyone's lips. I, I hear it everywhere, but yet my, my sense is, is that it's used almost to the point where it, it lacks meaning. Uh, let's try to provide, you know, this is the world that we're living in. What, what's our working definition? What, what does innovation mean? Yeah, I'll start. Um, I guess I'll go back to my comment earlier around value. At Hilton, to us, innovation doesn't have to be a piece of technology or type of IT or um, some product specific in the, in the tangible sense. It could literally be the just simply creation of value to whomever you're trying to appease, right? And um, similar to, to Brenda, we um, at Hilton expend a great deal of energy just helping a 100-year-old company think about things differently. And what I love about my job is frankly, the lack of guardrails and um, the freedom to kind of um, express and think differently and build something that wasn't there in the past, whatever it might be. And sometimes it's not a physical, tangible product. Sometimes it's a service in our case or the delivery of a service. Um, uh, via the gallery, which I was mentioning earlier, one of the, the great things is our ability to showcase the different work that we're doing and the different innovations. And personally, I, I, I don't like the word. I think it's overused, and, um, but we all use it, so here we go. Yeah. But um, we, what we try to showcase is not just the wonderful digital experiences that we're creating or the physical, tangible products that we're in the process of developing as well, but I also like to showcase different parts of the company um, who are driving value, and that could be in human resources. It could be in, um, you know, really any facet of the business. It could be in law. And um, we don't tend to, our, our brains tend to default to tech and gadgetry, which frankly is, is something, of course, and, and a great area of focus for us as well, but it's just a small piece of the puzzle. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to just d driving value and, and let Brenda go. Yeah. yeah, and for us, it's it's change with impact, mm -hmm. right? So in in driving value, in the way that people think in different dimensions. So innovation can be different to an individual, to a team, and then it can be different um, in that same organization at the way that people share knowledge and resources and um, what the enterprise is trying to, um, to accomplish. And so working in every single one of those dimensions and being um, customized to it is really important to us and, and helping to build that change again. It's really interesting to me uh, insofar as that I think people, a lot of people tend to think uh, about innovation in the context of technology. In fact, I can tell you having and continue to do a lot of work with the economic development uh, leaders in our region, politicians and so forth, that they really do equate innovation with technology. And I think that by doing that, they immediately miss the boat because really, uh, and you both teased it out, innovation is nothing more than the human brain thinking about creating something that's novel, that's new, that's going to cause somebody else to act in a particular way towards an outcome. Yep. It's, it's something that's valuable. The value can be economic value, the value can be social change, but 
so much, I mean, from my perspective as an investor, if I had a nickel for everybody who turned into my, in my office and said, I have a great idea, give me money, uh, I'd be rich because the answer is an idea means nothing. That's a creativity is great, but that's not, that's not an innovation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there, it can be in different forms too, right? Even if there's an in incremental change in that one person, in the way that they behave, the way that they interact with, with their team, that to me is just as valuable as a transformational change where where there's a huge you know overturn in the way that with that things work and and it's it's good to kind of go in and and take a look at what different dimensions you can, you can I mean maybe some it. of it is that um, we sort of we look at the world and we really lionize lottery winners and I, and I don't just mean the people that I mean, somebody's going to win Powerball this week and be a billionaire, right? I mean, have you all bought your Powerball tickets already? You, I, I assume you have because it may literally be the first trillion dollar ticket. I mean, imagine that. But we love lottery winners. It's fascinating. But if you think about the way we cover entrepreneurship and innovation, we love lottery winners. We love Mark Zuckerberg. We, like, uh, we, we love the, the Google founders. We love Warren Buffett. And we don't really lionize and get excited about the the block in tackling and just making a difference, but yet that's where most innovation actually occurs. Yeah, and I kind of want to draw a bridge to what you said earlier around innovation in large companies. Um, Hilton specifically has 390,000 employees around the world, so if you can imagine trying to instill a mindset or a culture of innovation within a company that large, it's a pretty hefty feat. Um, and I think the culture piece is a huge component of it, and it's just giving people the liberties and freedom to take risk, to make decisions from the bottom up instead of top down. Um, that's a big, big deal for us too, is how do you let someone like the customer inform our choices versus an executive make all the, the, the decisions for the business? Um, and that's a massive cultural shift, especially in a company like for, 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 for Hilton, for example, we're 100 years old um, and we're widespread, we're in every country around the world practically. Um, I can't even remember the exact number at this point, but how do you make sure that everyone, whether they're at a corporate office or delivering service on property, how do you give them the freedoms and the opportunity to take sort of a risk and go on a ledge and do something differently than we might do it the day prior and, and the years prior to that. So that, that's, that's been a, a complex piece of the puzzle too. I mean, organizational change is really an important part of this without question. Brenda, I've worked some with the, the Booz Allen uh, Innovation Group and one of the things that I think is really important for us to talk about is, is how you're really sort of changing the conversation. I mean, to be honest, Many people think about Booz Allen and Lockheed Martin and others, General Dynamics, as government contractors, which they tend to segment as a particular industry with a particular set of behaviors, good, bad, or otherwise. Booz Allen is, sets up this innovation center. It, it is, is part of doing this really to demonstrate that, you know, is it a new business model? I mean, what is it about having this active innovation uh, center? What, what, what's it really about for Booz? So, it kind of starts with uh, with the strategic investment group, as you as you alluded to. Uh, we had invested in the strategic investment group, invested in um, about six years ago. And had we placed an innovation center at that time, it would have basically been a relic. We wanted to build out this this new, as I mentioned, this new way of thinking, uh, this new way of of interacting with with each other, with our clients. Um, and, and use that, help them build a set of skills to then get us ready, right? Ready to build, to have this physical space that, that is the manifestation of our innovation agenda. Uh, so for us, it's more than just a, more than just a folly of a space where, where we bring in our clients and, um, and we kind of showcase, it's not a museum, it's a place where we incubate talent. It's more of a working space than it is an event space, even though there's obviously that balance of both. Uh, so innovation and, innovation to us is, is more, right? It's right. more than just 
more than just kind of It's more than just a, a word or hanging out, A buzzword, right? yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and that's really what I'm I mean, I've gone to meetings down there and you know, you go in and it's like, "Oh, let's let's go sit in a booth." It's like going to a diner, you know. Yeah. <laughs> really, our diner booths it's, are awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it's very different from uh, what what you would expect, which I think really is 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 the point, isn't it? That to if you want to get people to become more innovative, a lot of it's nonverbal cues, isn't it? Oh yeah, so you, you walk into the space and you automatically feel different. And we ask our government clients, really high level um, individuals who are used to wearing uniforms, right? Or are used to wearing um, a suit and tie every day. We ask them to come in in jeans because you put on a pair of jeans and you automatically start thinking differently than what you would if you were wearing a three-piece suit. That's true, particularly if you put them on over your head. I find that works really well for yeah. me. I feel very creative when I put my... <laughs> okay, that's just me. <laughs> what, other, what other tactics do you use to uh, uh, encourage people to think innovatively within an organization other than, uh, than space? Because I think space is important. What else do you use? Yeah, sure. So some of the things that my team specifically does outside of our customer customer experience innovation actual product work is we, um, multiple times a month, we bring in industry experts from every every business you can think of to help our own team members think about their portion of the business differently. So we'll put on, um, we do what we call Innovation Thought Leadership Exchange, or Idle Talks, where we'll bring in folks from different industries that have a panel of anywhere from four to six people, talk about things like marketing or loyalty or um, data, analytics, technology. Um, and that happens multiple, multiple times a month. We do things like study halls in our gallery in different parts of the office that have just different energy about them where if people want to get away from their desk and just sit in a new environment to think about their work, they come do that. Um, we have uh, really exciting sort of uh, pitch events, which sometimes pitch events get a bit um, playful in a, in a way, but what we do take away from them is not necessarily a product every time, but we get intel and we get to understand what other businesses are doing and what other products are out there, or other types of technology or thought processes that we can snag and keep in our back pocket. Um, one time we did a, a, a recent pitch event where eight of the ten products that, that were pitched to us from a venture capital um, group were just really not meant for our industry, but the 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 discussion around them became so powerful that it, it's a wonderful takeaway. So there's learnings every time. And just every time you put a new hundred, a set of hundred employees in the space and you let them kind of live and breathe um, a different energy, it sort of helps transmit um, excitement in the building and, uh, uh, you know, they take something back to their desk that they didn't have the day prior. So we do a lot of things like that as an example, one example. So one of the things that I find is that uh, having, so I get called in because people just assume if you invest money, you must be smart. But, uh, <laughs> you know, you say venture capitalists are, oh, innovation, technology. And so you stumble into uh, the opportunity to go and sit in boardrooms and, and talk about how do we create a culture of innovation. And one of the things I find most interesting and challenging about these projects is that, well, how many of you remember Winnie the Pooh? Remember Winnie the Pooh? <laughs> you know, it was 100 acre wood, 1,000 acre woods. I, I can't, it was a lot of acres. Well, <laughs> who do you think about I mean, Winnie the Pooh's world? Who do you think was the most innovative person among Winnie the Pooh's friends? If you were to guess. Bueller, anyone? What do you think? Shout it e out. What do you think? Eeyore? Not Eeyore. Hell no. <laughs> Tigger! Tigger! <laughs> Woohoo! Great idea. Let's go. Bam, bam, bam. He's over here. He's over there. The man is irrepressible. Who's the guy who's always doing the buzz kill? It's like, I don't know. Eeyore. Eeyore. <laughs> The biggest challenge if you're trying to create an organizational culture that has innovative or a startup that's innovative is everybody's got an Eeyore. Everybody's got the Eeyore. It's like, oh no, that may not work. Oh no. I, I, I'll, I'll keep to the end how I handle Eeyores. How do you guys handle Eeyores? It's easy to stay positive in the hospitality industry. I'll start out by saying that. Awesome. Yeah. We didn't rehearse this stuff. They're like, oh, God, he strung me up. No, and I, 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 uh, I tend to not be a stressed individual, number one, number two, so that helps out. But there's a bit of a sales tactic to it all, and being able to just convince people that it's okay to not have answers every time, or um, we don't use the word failure at work. Like, you know, that's, that's kind of another buzzword in the, the innovation world. Um, but I, I think um, it's, it's being persuasive in, in a kind of a new and different way. And um, 
and just being excited. I think people, uh, when you exude positivity and exude enthusiasm for the work that you get to do, you know, personally, I feel immensely grateful every day. I literally love my job. Um, so that, that people see that and, and want to be part of the same fun. So they kind of hop on board quite readily, if I'm honest. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, to me, it's okay to have that diversity of thought as well. Right, so even though you do have an EOR, part of it is changing that mindset to say, okay, I understand that you're saying that this might not work, but what would you change so that it could work, right? right? And, and having that, again, that inter incremental change in thought, right? Having them kind of take a leap and take that risk and say, okay, let me think about how this could work. Basically, what I'm getting at is that what I find really interesting about innovation, if you are interested in your own careers as being an innovator, is that fundamentally, to be a great innovator, you have to also be a really great leader. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to uh, influence people and get them to bend to your will. And that's a very hard thing to do in an innovation context because innovation, by its nature, is free-flowing, ambiguous, the outcome is not certain. So in other words, if, you, if your authority depends upon command and control, listen to me because I'm in charge, you probably want to create an innovative culture because people have to be able to meander off. It's the difference between having a really well-trained dog and herding cats, I suppose. <laughs> Innovation is herding cats. But here's the funny thing. At some point, if you're really serious about this, you are going to have to face the person who literally is going to passive-aggressive you to death. They literally are just, no not gonna work, here's the data, not gonna work, let's study it some more. And I gotta tell you, what I found the most effective thing to do in that situation is to make sure that you have what I would call already established your Sherpas. You know, the people that are around the idea, the people that are around the project that have bought in. Because once you have that, they're watching how you're gonna deal with Eeyore. And if you don't deal with Eeyore and say, that's great, this probably isn't for you, it's okay for you to go back to do what you're doing, you'll lose the group. Yeah, you talked about leadership and the word ambiguity. Uh, one of the things we always say is you have to be okay with ambiguity. So my entire team, they know that from day to day there's not going to be any certainties, and they have to be okay with that, and they have to be an advocate for their own cause. One of the things that we we are relentless about is um, socializing our purpose um, in every facet of the business. and so. Um, if you are persistently communicative and you know how to toggle the fence between you know, the more open-minded individual and then communicating differently to the, to the person who has a little bit more um, hesitance in their, in their vantage point, um, I think the art of communication becomes really, really critical in the way that you can um, be, be persuasive, um, almost, almost talk to your peers as if they are um, externals and how do you kind of get them in your camp even when that's just so against their own grain. That's right. Then also, um, also not having groupthink, right? Like yes. finding ways to um, take that diversity and say, maybe there's a person who is a complete introvert and does not want or does not want to share their idea in a public way. Like how do you do? How do you still capture that idea? How do you still um, ensure that their voice is heard? Maybe not in the way that um, someone else would want their voice to be heard. I think the point about diversity is one that we really want to amplify here, uh, is if you look at corporate America and you look at some of the most spectacular scandals and flameouts that have occurred over the last few years, for example, the Volkswagen scandal around diesel engines not working or how Uber's corporate uh, uh, culture developed and many others, what they all have in common is lack of diversity, right? On the board level in an organization where there's groupthink. If you really want to have an innovative organization and a learning organization, these days it's table stakes, I think, to have diversity of experience, diversity of, of gender, all this stuff, because otherwise I think you end up with a really dangerous situation in, in a really rapidly changing world. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I think that's the reason for why Caitlin and I are in some of the positions that we've been in, right, and are right now, is because we have this crazy path that we've taken. Yeah, and, and in a funny way, I, I, same with me. I, you know, it's funny, I, I had somebody uh, at, at lunch a couple weeks ago say to me, God, what, you do all these different things. What, how did it happen and what's your plan? And I, I looked at him and I said, 
well, it happened because it happened. What's my plan? Jeez, I don't know. We were talking about what's your... F so you, you, I think if you ask an innovative person who really likes being innovative what their plan for two, three, five, ten years from now, I don't... There is no plan. There is no plan. It's too constraining. It's too constraining to have a plan to me, to, to like know exactly what's going to happen. I'd rather have like a broader theme of where I'm going to go. But that is our plan. That, that I think is what, that was the aha moment for me. I may not know exactly how I'm going to make my money, but I know that it's going to involve entrepreneurs, innovation, exactly. technology, you know what I mean? And I, yeah. and I think that's how innovators tend to think. I remember being in college and one of my professors said, uh, you are a scanner. And I thought, oh, I don't know what that means. <laughs> and what I learned to find out was that he, me he meant you want to know everything and you get excited by kind of the cross-section of all these different disciplines. Um, and to your point around planning, um, I have a brother who's 10 years younger than me and he always says, Caitlin, I need to know what I'm going to do in five years, to which I respond, no, you don't. Figure out what you're going to do today, do it well, and the rest will kind of fall into place. So... Um, enjoy being a scanner, enjoy kind of dabbling a little bit of everything, and um, ultimately I think when you take the best of all your past experiences exactly. and the best, yeah. um, you know, we, we talked earlier, your, your friend had said, do whatever feels really hard. Yes. And to me that sort of drives, drives me too. I, it needs to be complex, almost impossible to figure out, and um, allows me to draw on a vast array of skills that I've kind of developed over the years, and that's where I get really excited. So we have a few minutes left. I, I thought I'd give it a moment. Any of you have any sp questions you'd like to ask? I, I've got a few more, but. <laughs> well, the mics are there and they're empty. <laughs> Volare, oh. Okay, so we've got a, a three and a half minutes left and um, we've stunned them into submission, so good job. <laughs> um, we haven't talked about technology, but I think technology is at a really interesting crossover point. It's becoming so ubiquitous in so many ways. Do, do you think that creativity and innovation are really being enhanced by some of these tools that we're seeing now? Yes, I, oh, oh, that's, this, this could be another 30 minute segment, but I will... We got three minutes, so yes. you know, we're good. <laughs> okay. um, I think one of the, th the things that will forever continue to change and make our world very complex and sort of petrifying in some way is just data and the access to data and the ability to use data to make decisions for us or inform how we um, manage our business, treat our customers, all those types of things. Um, so. Well, it has its many perks. It has, uh, it, it, it's, it's something we need to keep our eye on and manage very closely because we, it, there's a tendency to kind of give up your um, services and products to technology, um, artificial intelligence, data, and lean on that too far. So finding the balance between what just should remain human decision and human services and those types of things and what can be supplemented and, uh, by technology, I think that balance and understanding that from your own respective businesses um, is an important conversation to have. Yeah. And it's also important for me um, to to know what's driving what, right? Like sometimes technology is driving decisions, sometimes decisions are driving technology. Um, and so kind of balancing that line between, between the two and ensuring that, that the right decisions are being made in the right way. It would seem to me that uh, what I'm seeing more and more is that digital literacy is, is table stakes now if you actually want to be either a participating citizen in our country or, or a leader. And I'm not just talking about having a Twitter feed. Uh, I'm actually talking about having some conceptual understanding. When we talk about artificial intelligence, you know, people tend to think, oh, well, it's going to be HAL and it's going to be the Terminator. Actually, no, it's going to be highly complex software that's going to be able to do highly complex but routine tasks better than we can and faster relatively soon, which for just one example, means that if you haven't developed high cognitive skills, if you haven't developed your innovative brain or your creativity, what's going to be left? And I think that's why ultimately, for me, what technology is doing more than anything else is it's really, really pushing us where we've got to understand this stuff but stay ahead of it. Otherwise, you know, we're going to be like Detroit without the charm. Right. And also be able to... Uh, divest yourself like of these administrative tasks, these tasks that um, that end up being a lot easier for a, a machine or technology to do, so that you can free up your brain to to what's next, right? Mm -hmm. 
And I'll say one last thing to that point, because a lot of new and fantastic technology is being developed by really young minds. Um, we do a lot of things with universities, and we invest a great deal in youth, either via training or talent or actual recruitment. Um, we spend uh, time with um, young kids, college students, and so on. Um, and if we want our businesses to benefit a great deal from technology, then we need to also appreciate the folks who are um, probably the smartest in yeah, that camp absolutely. in the first place. Well, I want to thank you all for being such a, a great audience. I want to thank Caitlin McKenna and Rinda and Gupta. You guys were wonderful. We and I really enjoyed talking with you, and we're going to get you on what's working in Washington soon for sure. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.